Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of the Surge Podcast. So, uh, for today, I will be doing a topic that was requested on iTunes by uh, Andika Celia, who wanted me to do Reboa. Um, yeah, so <laughs> clearly, uh, saying do Reboa uh, 15 times in a row uh, makes it very clear that I'm going to be doing Reboa today. Uh, thank you for the five stars, and uh, thank you for uh, reviewing uh, the podcast on iTunes. Uh, it's good to see that I have people in Indonesia uh, listening to it. I was invited there. Very beautiful country, by the way. Everybody should go, in my opinion. Really interesting. Uh, very interesting healthcare system. Uh, very, very, very nice people. So, Riboa, a primer. So uh, I can't remember what it stands for anymore. Uh, I usually prepare these slides as talking points like 10 minutes before I start, 15 minutes before I start. Um, as usual, you're going to hear my phone ring every now and then. I'm on call. I apologize. So uh, I can't remember what it stands for anymore. But in the interest of full disclosure, um, I don't use it in Kuwait that often, but I do teach it a lot outside of Kuwait, and I do proctor it. And I learned it from endovascular surgeons um, who, who I think you should try and get to know very well if you're going to be doing this stuff. Whether you're from an eMERGE background, ICU background, or surgery background, I don't care. If you're going to be doing Reboa, get to know your endovascular guys, right? So for today, we'll be talking about uh, some of the concepts, the ethos, uh, the indications, effectiveness, so a quick rundown and some pearls. So whenever I talk about anything technical, you hear me say the word concept a lot. It's because I think that the concepts and the general principle, or the guiding principle, uh, when I say general principle, I mean the overview. When I say guiding principle, I mean the intent behind the move. So if you understand the intent behind the Matox maneuver, you can perform it very well, very adequately for your needs. The intent here being exposing huge vessels in the retroperitoneum. Uh, when I say that the intent behind uh, ultrasound-guided central line insertion, your ability uh, to target the vessel correctly, to ensure that you're in the right place correctly, to perform the steps in the correct manner, uh, exponentially improves because you understand the guiding principle behind it. And so the guiding principle behind Reboa is proximal control. And what I mean by proximal control is to stop the blood from getting into the area where the hole in the vessel is. Distal control is to stop the blood from flowing back from where the blood would normally go had the hole not been there. And that's what I mean by proximal and distal control. Uh, another way of putting it is if it's an artery, then you're talking about the part that's closest to the heart. If it's a vein, then you're talking about the part that's closest to where the blood is flowing from in the legs, for example. So a Reboa is a form of proximal control, very similar to clamping a vessel, but you're doing it on the inside. And just like clamping a vessel, you can do it partially as well. If you understand this concept, it becomes easy to translate it. Now, the reason why Reboa and other forms of hemorrhage control of this type are important is because non-compressible hemorrhage remains an extremely, extremely prevalent cause of death and trauma. So we've gotten better at airway obstructions, even in the combat theater. We've gotten better at tension pneumothoraces, even in the combat theater. But to this day, we're having a huge problem dealing with non-compressible hemorrhages of the torso. And by the torso, I mean the chest and the abdomen. And I think that it's very important to understand. I know that trauma sounds boring. I know that trauma is a single, uh, what they call it, a single shock science. But when you look at the bigger scheme of things, damage control resuscitation has undergone a robust change. And now we have multiple different tricks that we can use. And so it's very important to understand where Reboa fits into this. And that's going to be part of our talk today. It's to understand that Reboa is an in-hospital form of damage control and that it is normally used as a bridge to get you towards definitive care, right? Just a quick review of uh, torso hemorrhages and how to do them right and wrong. So in the 1970s, generally as surgeons, we used to think that the quicker we could get into the abdominal for abdominal bleeding, the better the surgeon was and the better the outcomes were. Uh, Kenneth Mattox and David Feliciano, who are like the trauma surgeons. So these are the guys who define trauma 
uh, to an extent that I can say uh, Bruce Lee defined Jeet Kune Do. Uh, these are probably two of the strongest, the best trauma surgeons ever. And so I think that they were testing the principle. They tried to do emergency department laparotomies. And what ended up happening was uh, 51 of 51 patients died. Uh, and they had no survivors uh, using that method. And so the decision was made that the best method would be to clamp the aorta in the chest to be able to control the bleeding below. And uh, the role of thoracic uh, aortic occlusion was sort of first described at Wayne State, but it was Mattox again. And David Feliciano wrote a whole bunch of articles on this too, proving the same thing. And this is a proof that showed that if you address the chest in the emergency room, by opening the chest and clamping off the aorta, getting proximal control, i.e. the same thing that you would do endovascularly with a reboa, if you did that, you had about a 25% survival rate in agonal patients with systolic below 60 and bradycardia. The concepts here are pretty much that you're dealing with non-compressible hemorrhage, an occlusion of the aorta, proximal control, and diverting cardiac output towards vital organs, such as the chest, the sorry, the heart, the lungs, and the brain, not the chest. And the added advantage of keeping the chest closed might be able to push that 25% a little bit further. So this wasn't the first time that we tried Reboa. Um, or Reboa wasn't a new invention, more aptly. It was actually started off in the Korean War in 1954. They tried to land a radio OPEC catheter that you can see here, where there was a balloon at the tip. They inflated in three agonal patients and all three of them died. This was a U.S. Army funded project in Walter Reed Medical Center, and it didn't go very well. Uh, needless to say, uh, it was dormant for a while. Technology got better over time. And in the pre-interventional radiology point of care ultrasound days, um, it was restricted to penetrating injury, but ribos were still kind of used. There were a couple of case reports here and there. And it was done through a cut-down method uh, for patients with a systolic of about 80 and um, who were considered agonal. It was used to control the bleeding from the site more so than to actually, um, you know, sort of um, avoid using pressors at the time. Because in 1989, we still loved vasopressors and trauma. And now we don't. I hate vasopressors and trauma. I'm not going to change my mind. You can try and kill me for it. I'll only use it for brain trauma. Our reality is that in that time, and one of the key advantages, in my opinion, for 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 ribos and precluder devices, as they were called back then, uh, is the fact that when you have it inflated, the planes are so nice and clean. And the bleeding is very easy to see. Uh, and the holes are very easy to see and suture up. Right, it's like you have a very proximal clamp. When you don't have it up, it, it, like the amount of bleeding that you get out of the abdomen is horrendous. Right. Fast forward to the two thousands, and vascular surgeons are now fixing ruptured triple A's endovascularly, and so that led to a huge evolution in our knowledge base of this. Now, the first two groups to do that was two thousand two thousand and five, but moving forward from then in the twenty tens. We start to see clinical series come in where trauma surgeons were using it for non-compressible torso hemorrhages that were both blunt and penetrating, including pelvic fractures. And, uh, you know, as you can see from uh, propensity score analysis, although you would think that the outcomes would be good, what ended up happening was this. And this reflects the Japanese trauma data bank, as you can clearly see. And I can't figure out why their survival rates were lower with Reboa. And I suspect it's, it's three things, uh, just having visited Japan myself. Uh, the first is the fact that there's a learning curve with Reboas, and it was fairly recently introduced there. The second is that their emergency department is segregated from their surgical department in terms of their roles in trauma. So one of the things that you have to realize, especially if you have a North American background, is around the world there are still general surgeons who are uh, labeled as general surgeons, who uh, will do trauma and will be first for response for surgical interventions in trauma, but will not have a leadership role in coordinating the other services involved. And you will have emergency doctors who will have a role in the resuscitative aspect of trauma care, 
but will not be actively able to decide if the surgeons will operate. They do not have a full TTL system in place. They have a joint custody system where it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a horizontal program as opposed to a vertical one, whereby the emergency doctor does their best to keep the patient alive with the ICU typically, will call the orthopedic surgeon to roll out any fractures, and then have those addressed while they're waiting for the general surgeon to make a decision on whether or not to operate on this patient. And, you know, as you can see, that, that, that sort of care plan works in terms of hospital flow because your patient's going to get through the hospital flow very quickly, but it may not work uh, for high-intensity, high ISS score, very severe traumas like the ones that require reboas. And I think that that might be another problem. The third problem might be the false sense of security. When you've inflated that balloon and you get a systolic of 80 or 90, you're more likely to try and wait and see if the patient will respond uh, to uh, fluids, etc., and, and blood products. And I think that having that mentality doesn't work because that just tells me that you don't know what a reboa does, with all due respect to the people who wrote the paper. I think that if you're waiting for somebody to respond to a blood transfusion after you deploy the Reboa device and you're not going to angio and you're not going to cut their skin open, you have a problem because you don't understand that you've just clamped off the aorta and you're killing off the kidneys without acting upon it. I'm sorry, I lost it there a little bit, but it's because I've had this argument 150 times with the guys over here and, you know, it's a problem. When you do compare Reboas with ED thoracotomies and sensors that provide vertically integrated care, like uh, Scalia's group, uh, you tend to find that ribos are far superior. Yes, the number is smaller for the Reboa group. And yes, uh, you know, the uh, uh, trauma burden seems to be relatively contained to uh, a quarter by quarter by quarter chest abdomen uh, extremity. Like it's, it's like that type of thing. And yes, the ISIS score was slightly lower in the Reboa group. All these things are correct. But you can't deny 37.5%. Uh, like it would be a very hard number to deny because I put it to you this way. So 37.5% uh, is nine patients out of 24. So if I went for 9.7% of 24, that's three patients. So it's six more patients survived. And I think that even if that's potentially wrong, the probability of having six more patients survive by just having this available to you in the emergency room is amazing. But the question becomes, when do I get away with it? When do I do a reboa versus an ED thoracotomy? And my answer to you is it depends on how well your emergency room is equipped for deploying reboas within your program. You should not deploy it if it takes longer than an ED thoracotomy does. I'll say this again. Your concept should be who's faster. You with your catheter or me, me with my ED thoracotomy. You can both be trauma surgeons or you can both be eMERGE docs or you can both be intensivists. And yes, I've met one or two intensivists with an internal medicine background who can comfortably open a chest and clear a tamponade. Like it's kooky when you see it. And I know one anesthetist who can open a chest faster than I can. David Bracco, if you're listening, you taught me half of what I know, the anesthesia half. When can you get away with it becomes who's faster, the guy who's holding the catheter or the guy who's who's opening the chest? And that's how I would start it off. I would start off with a systolic of 90, just like they do at the University of Maryland, and I've taken permission to publish their um, their algorithm. And, you know, I, I would set up a common femoral A-line uh, for your bow if my systolic is less than 90. I would upsize it uh, to a 7 or 12 French sheath. And then I would deploy the Reboa depending on what I see. If I suspect any bleeding within the torso, I'd go for zone one, which is from the subclavian uh, to the perirenal aorta. Zone two is from the perirenal aorta and below, and zone three is infrarenally. Um, so I would deploy my Reboa in zone one. If it's an isolated pelvic injury or I have a high suspicion that it's an isolated pelvic bleed, I would deploy it in zone three and save the kidneys. Uh, the Korean and Japanese guidelines are very similar in that nature, but they offer a straight-to-embolization paradigm or straight-to-surgery paradigm with orthopedics involved as well, as you can see, right? Whereas the University of Maryland guideline will always advocate for a laparotomy first. The uh, Japanese have a level of intricacy where they go into uh, whether or not angioembolization, preperitoneal pelvic packing, surgery, or orthopedics should be involved. And that's, that's why, you know, 
I illustrate the point of, of it being a more questions, more thought processes involved when you're dealing with trauma in Japan than when you're dealing with in the States where you have one person um, taking ownership of the situation, right? And the question becomes, who should own Reboa? I think that the person who's receiving the systolic of AT trauma should be doing the Reboas. The person who's responsible for keeping the patient alive should be doing the Reboas. It should not be a discussion that should be had at chairman level if your chairmans aren't on the ground with you. All due respect to all chairmans, I've worked in a bunch of different hospitals. Some of them are more hands-on, some of them are more hands-off. There's advantages to both systems. I like working with both types. What I don't like is people making decisions that could affect my daily practice without asking me. And this is one of those things that has to be discussed at that level. So I teach Reboa all around the world. And the saddest thing I've seen is arguments over who should take ownership of this toy and treating it like a toy. It is not a toy. We like toys. I do refer to it as a toy every now and then. But the patient's life isn't. If you are an anesthetist who does ECMO regularly on a semi-elective or elective basis or even in the ICU, but you're not used to dealing with things in the emergency room and you're making an argument that you should be doing Reboa because you do ECMO anyway and you know how to access a vein and an artery, okay, that's great, but have the conversation with your emergency room to make sure that it happens in the correct manner, and that you have what you need to simulate what you do in the ICU and in your operating room. If you're a vascular surgeon who only works in an angio suite, and you want to come to the resuscitation room and do a reboa, and you don't know how to do it without an x-ray and without fluoro, dude, have that discussion early. Make sure that you have them available. And make sure that you're willing to own the patient, right? If you're a general surgeon who does not deal with trauma acutely but has emergency doctors who do, invest in championing those emergency doctors. If you're like me, you're a trauma surgeon, you're always in the emergency room, you cover TTL call for as many days as you can, you cover ICU call, you cover whatever you cover, and you're perfectly comfortable working in an emergency room doing ultrasound-guided stuff as well as fluoroscopic stuff as well as static X-ray stuff, and you've done Rebo 150 times, try and get other people integrated. If they're around. So I don't care who does it, but the person who owns the patient should be the person trained to do the rebel, the service that owns the patient. And the service who can do it fastest should be able to do the rebel. And the reason why is to keep the patient alive. Now, the classical indications for rebel deployment are non compressible pelvic hemorrhage, a belly bleed, whether it's in the retroperitoneum or the abdomen, and that's why I call it the belly because. I don't really separate the abdomen, the retroperitoneum that much. Or intraperitoneal, retroperitoneal, we call it what you will. Hemorrhagic shock, NYD, typically in zone uh, one. And the caveat to this is a non-survivable head injury, I would say. Or an extremity, uh, because once you increase the blood pressure, they're going to bleed more. I'd say put a tourniquet if it's an extremity problem. And, you know, I would contend that a response to Reboa means that you could take the patient to angio if you wanted to, unless they are agonal, really. In terms of other indications, so off-the-book recommendations or off-the-book indications that have been mentioned in the literature include gynecological bleeds, orthopedic bleeds, uh, other forms of shock, uh, tumor resections, and angiography. Whenever you're setting up Reboa, you should have this stuff in your resuscitation room and in your emergency room. You should have nurses that can deal with art lines, art line monitors, good ultrasound. By good ultrasound, I mean good ultrasound performers and a good ultrasound machine. A fluoro or an X-ray A arm would be ideal. You can do static X-rays. I do do that occasionally, but you decide. The introducer sheaths that you need, uh, 6, 7, 8, uh, 9, up to 15 French. The occluder device itself, so the balloon. My favorite is the Cook Coda balloon because I don't mind fixing it later. And have an arterial repair device or a pathway to call your vascular surgeon to help you repair it later on. Um, this is what my uh, setup looks like whenever I insert the codas. You can see I did one with um, the pelvic binder base. I just cut a triangle in the pelvic binder to get it in there. And this is another one. Uh, 
Uh, I prefer the Kodos despite the fact that it's a 12 French sheath, uh, simply because it is a 12 French sheath. Um, I like them because uh, I'm very used to putting them in. I was trained with them when uh, I used to cover the end of Asker service. Um, they do require a closure device, they do require bigger sheaths, but they're easier to land in and they're slicker through the actual sheath. Uh, I also like the fact that the Koda balloon can be partially inflated with a good volume in it still. Um, it comes with a, a balloon inflation port to the side and a wire access port that you can use as your A-line as well and gives you waveforms from distal. Uh, the Take Balloon is a different system. Uh, the Take Balloon can work with a 7 French sheath, so potentially you could even fem stop this. Potentially, you can get away with it. I wouldn't because your patients are coagulopathic. If they need Reboa for a trauma reason, they probably bled to death or are very close to bleeding to death. So I wouldn't, but you can potentially. But I wouldn't. I would use a stat close or an arterial closure device. They're slightly smaller catheters, and um, there are certain things that I want to talk about with these, which I'll talk about in a second. I've recently used one, my first one. This I haven't used yet. I haven't used in real life. Uh, I have access to them. I just haven't had a case yet. I would very much like to use it. So this is the ER Reboa system from, uh, I think it's, yeah, the, Rebo the ER Reboa system. It's a seven French sheath and it's an all-in-one system with the introducer sheath on block. So you can go boom, guide wire, dilator in, right? It's just straight up with the introducer sheath. And it comes with distance markings. If you were to make me pick between the Takai balloon and this, I would probably pick this because I don't need a guide wire with it. Whereas with the Takai balloon system, I do need a guide wire. And one of the reasons why I don't like it is because the guide wire has to fit in through a small hole and you're restricting the types that you can use. Whereas with the Coda balloon, I can use a stiff amplats. And a stiff amplats for me in an aorta is like butter. It just goes through, man. So that's how I would set up an ER Reboa system. Uh, you know, give me your feedback on this, uh, this all-in-one uh, ER Reboa system and let me know. But there are a whole bunch of others. There were five in the market last I checked. I'm sure that there'll be number six soon. Uh, I would say that the uh, Tokai Medical and the Pride Time ER Reboa are probably going to be the mainstay in emergency rooms, despite my love for the Coda Balloon, just because they're so easy to use uh, for emergency doctors. But I would say, you know, get ready for a takeoff and landing. I do this with all balloon systems, but particularly with the smaller balloon systems, sometimes the catheter won't go through the sheath itself like the balloon itself will get stuck on the sheath. And so I feed it through, I de-air the balloon, test it, prepare a syringe with contrast. I feed it through a couple of times, make sure that it goes through nice and slick. And then I establish access, put the sheath in through with a dilator, pull the dilator out, land the guide wire, uh, land the appliance, uh, get an x-ray, make sure it's there, uh, deploy the device, get a second x-ray, and then check the art line trace. And I personally stitch them in place. The manufacturers just say to sticker them on. In terms of access, I think femoral cutdowns are a thing of the past. I think that if you're going to do uh, any form of percutaneous procedure, ultrasound should always be used, right? Whether it's a pigtail, whether it's a cholecystostomy, whether it's a cath, ultrasound should always be used. How far should you go? So imaging is key. If you can get fluoro, get it. If you can't, measure out to the ziphoid to hit your zone, uh, the edge of zone three, and measure out uh, to the suprasternal uh, notch to hit your zone one. And uh, that would be about 46 centimeters or 28 centimeters, respectively. Get an x ray, and then you can deploy your device. Okay, it's very important to get an x-ray because otherwise disasters can happen and I've had to repair them, Lord help me, while the vascular surgeon sheepishly looks at me and the fellow who I was training just stares at the floor. Please don't do this to me, get an x-ray. <laughs> then plan your next move. So when I say plan your next move, I mean from the emergency room. Uh, should you go to Angio? Should you go to the OR? Or is your patient uh, turning the corner? And if they are, you know, I tend to land it in zone three. Some people do partial deflations. There's no good data there. Uh, 
In terms of closure and how long you can keep it in, there's no good data. I would say clamp time of over four hours is a bit of a problem if you're above the kidneys. Six hours is certainly a problem. And intermittent decompression could be an issue. There isn't that much data on how long it takes to learn. But there was a, a basic endovascular uh, skills and trauma course where they looked at how many you should do. And it's a teach one, do one, uh, see, uh, see one, teach one, two one type of situation. The golden number seems to be 40. I'll be honest with you. When I proctor people, uh, usually after about 10, they're okay. I haven't seen that many disasters. There was only one place, and it was a place where people were competing over who does it. If you all work as a team, things go well. Uh, lastly, I'll be dealing with this in greater detail. I'll be doing a whole talk on endovascular complications, whether it's uh, Reboa, ECMO, or whatever else, and how to address them. But uh, know that at every stage, there should be a concern or a hazard. So during arterial access, you could land in a vein instead. You could puncture the artery and dissect it. Uh, you could puncture through the inguinal ligament, which is not disastrous, but could happen. Uh, during the balloon uh, selection and positioning, uh, it could move up and down. The guide wire itself could be too stiff and could actually rip through something or land it in the arm instead. During balloon inflation, you could overinflate, causing disaster that we don't talk about, and free damage to the aortic wall. Uh, during balloon deflation, you could deflate and actually cause a profound hypotension, which would uh, lead to a sudden arrest, especially if you engaged anything earlier. And during sheath removal, you can cause a hematoma or pseudoaneurysm formation. Uh, this is Saad Azid. Uh, thank you for listening, and thank you for requesting the topic. Um, I'll try and put up a couple of videos uh, if I can get um, permission from the copyright owner because I, I sort of work for a company that does this teaching stuff and I, I'm not sure, uh, they're not sponsoring me so I'm not going to mention their names. I'm only joking, uh, but I'm not, but I am. <laughs>